Hi everyone. Welcome to the demo lecture for uh, social, determin social determinants of health. I apologize for the delay. Um, part of the challenge that I was having was essentially uh, the issue that um, the YouTube wasn't YouTube wasn't willing to accept my videos in the format that I wanted to present them in. But I found a workaround. I'm using Zoom. Um, the quality with Zoom doesn't tend to be as fantastic as the old um, Rec Go app that I was using on my iPad, but it should still be good enough and it should still give you a pretty good idea as to how to do a short presentation. You'll probably see on my screen that there are about 20 slides on the left. There is absolutely no way that I can go through a really, <coughs> excuse me, really good presentation in 10 minutes and uh, uh, go through 20 slides with all the content as well. Now, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, I apologize for the break, is I'm going to suggest a few different tips um, so that you have a good sense of what I'm looking for in a presentation. And then we can go from there and, and uh, um, you know, hopefully that's helpful in you preparing your slides. I'm just gonna put this on presentation mode so that you can see the full screen. Now, uh, this is, uh, you, you can go ahead and ignore the date. This is from a time when we used to have this course live and um, I would give a couple of, demo, uh, couple of demo presentations for students. So typically, if you if you have just ten minutes, uh, a few pointers, uh, you know, have maybe four to six slides. Um, try not to have too much material on the slides because you want your audience to listen to you. So not not too much material on the slides. Sometimes there is a large quote, and I will be using an example of that in my presentation. Uh, my presentation is going to be probably four slides or five slides at the most today, because I'm going to try to stick to that 10 minute um, uh, uh, timeline. The other thing is, I, I know you will all read a lot to prepare for your background. Uh, you are not going to be able to communicate all of the information that you've learned and you will have to prioritize. So if you have to prioritize, make sure that you talk about the, your social determinant of health, make sure you talk about its implications uh, when that determinant has impacted through a life course. So use the life course perspective. And finally, make a statistical connection with what's going on and why it's important to address uh, the social determinant of health in Canada. Okay, I'll try to have a nice summary slide. In my example presentation, I do not have a nice summary slide and I apologize for that. It's not intentional, it is just that um, I think that it will make the point well enough, even without it. Um, but for your presentations, try to have a quick summary slide. It does not have to have a bunch of bullet points. It can have one or two sentences or even a picture. It doesn't matter. Okay. So we're going to pretend that I'm starting the presentation now, and I will attempt to finish my presentation in about 10 minutes. Now, keep in mind that your presentation may be nine minutes or 11 minutes. You're not going to get penalized for a small increase in, in, in the time or a small decrease in the time. I'm, I'm not nitpicky that way, so I, I, I don't want you to worry about it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce myself. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Krishnan Venkatraman and today I will talk to you about why it's important to study the social determinants of health, perhaps even more than individual risk factors. So from a background perspective, as we work our way through this course, it's going to become increasingly clear that there's very little dispute that social determinants of health or living conditions are the primary causes of disease and illness. Repeatedly, studies find that these conditions are the best predictors of health outcomes, and their effects are far more greater than the effects of behavioral risk factors such as diet, physical activity, and even tobacco use. So in this very short lecture, I'm, I'm going to talk about the role of social structures 
in health itself um, and social determinants than individual factors. So traditional health frameworks have deficiencies. We have already mentioned that it's, it's, it's a very narrow um, mechanism by which health challenges are identified. So traditional health frameworks, they pay a lot of attention to behavioral risk factors such as physical activity, diet, uh, tobacco use, alcohol use, and how these different factors affect health. These approaches are interesting, but they identify um, uh, essentially those individuals who have these so-called health threatening behaviors. And that's where all health promotion activity is also directed. What these approaches don't do is they say absolutely nothing about how social determinants of health actually affect these individuals' health and shape their adoption of these life threatening behaviors. So if someone's smoking, why are they smoking? If someone consumes excessive alcohol, why are they consuming excessive alcohols? So they don't look at those factors. So these narrow models, they don't emphasize actions to improve all of the social determinants that we Canadians may experience. So, the, you know, this brings us to the argument for broader frameworks. Broader frame frameworks are, are of much greater value. They look at how social determinants of health directly and indirectly influence health. What these frameworks do is they identify the immediate and more distant societal structures that shape the quality of the social determinants of health that people experience and how these different structures affect or lead to health problems. So in broader frameworks, there is a recognition that there's a role for biology there is a role for psychology in leading to health situations, okay? So uh, they definitely influence the body and the mind. Uh, however, what they do is they look at how these social determinants get under the skin and actually influence these biological factors or psychological factors to truly impact health and well-being. The other thing these broader frameworks do is beyond the existing social framework, they also look at political forces, economic forces that change policy, that change social structure, that change social resources, um, and how these things actually impact how the determinants themselves and how they impact how biology and physiology and psychology works in the context of these change social structures. These broader frameworks, what they do is they analyze pathways and mechanisms by which gender, race, social status, all you know, factors like these are related to the quality of the social determinant of health experience. So that begs the question that despite all this great understanding and knowledge, there is still a considerable amount of attention paid by researchers and health workers in the media to individual approaches and basically the idea that you're focused on individual risk behaviors. And that's, that's the whole point of my next few slides. So an individual perspective, which is putting the emphasis or in a sense, the blame on the individual and individual perspective, what it does is it limits analysis of health risks to just individual biomedical and behavioral risk factors for disease. So if someone smokes, they are at risk for lung cancer, it's the smoking that caused the cancer. While that is absolutely true and you can show a cause and effect, we have to remember is it doesn't address the important question as to why this person continued to smoke for several decades. Why didn't they cease smoking? Why did they start smoking in the first place? So it doesn't address that perspective. And that's why you know, I bring that example up. Now, for biomedical indicators, typically when you look at individual risks, what you do is you screen for psychological risk factors, medical risk factors. You look at hypertension, excess weight, cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, et cetera. 
So some of these health threats um, are addressed in the form of some kind of a behavioral regime. Hey, uh, if someone is obese, well, uh, you need to be on a diet, you need to manage your weight, you need to eat healthy, and it, it's kind of prescriptive. Or there's a treatment of drugs, somebody having type two diabetes because they're overweight are treated with drugs like metformin, which help lower the blood sugar. So th this, is, this is typically the biomedical method of dealing with the problem. The other approach is the behavioral risk factor. So um, one way is to treat it with diet, the other is the lifestyle, and then people are exhorted to do things. So, uh, you know, the, uh, an obese patient might be encouraged to change their diet, eat uh, quote unquote healthy food, um, uh, walk more, be more active. And these the problem with these individual perspectives is they carry the assumption that these factors are the primary contributors to various health conditions. Now, these biomedical and behavioral risk factors may contribute to disease, but there's very little evidence to assign these risk factors a primary role in explaining how disease and illness come about. Uh, they might be the penultimate factor to get to a disease. So let's say, for example, obesity, type two diabetes. So all biomedical me mechanisms do is they make this connection. They don't necessarily address what happens here or how many steps there are to get to here. That doesn't happen, okay? In fact, for all of these conditions, CVD is cardiovascular disease, T2D is type 2 diabetes, respiratory disease, and stomach cancers, all these conditions that even though biomedical and behavioral factors have a role, it is minor as compared to the social determinants of health in predicting um, not just these, but even life expectancy, okay, amongst uh, several other afflictions. Agency is a term that most gerontology students are exposed to early on. And the idea of agency is that people taking responsibility and uh, accounting for their own actions. There is an assumption that these risk factors can be modified with great in improvement in health, either by medical intervention or the person making healthy choices. So that's where agency comes in, make your own choices and minimize the risk. Uh, there's very little evidence to support the assumption that people at risk can change their behaviors by making healthy choices. And classic example is, if you ask extremely poor people to eat more fruits and vegetables, fresh fruit and vegetables, there's almost no chance that that'll occur because fresh food, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit is expensive. Cheap food is the frozen pizza dinner or frozen TV dinner that they can afford. Okay. So that, that's the issue with the current system. Um, the, the biggest problem with an individualistic approach is the, the ignoring of a macro situation, which is the factors that affect everything around the person. So it, it just does not account for living conditions, health status of the population or marginalized populations. So I'm going to make this my last slide, but I think it's it's quite um, I think it's quite evident, and hopefully I have started to make all of you think about the fact that individualistic lenses are the least helpful when looking at chronic disease. Basically, the idea is if you fail, it's your fault and not the system's. Okay. Um, uh, despite. Uh, the clear inadequacy in current systems, uh, which explain how different social determinants of health shape health. We don't necessarily know how each determinant shapes health perfectly. Um, but we know they all help. They or they impact health significantly over a life course. Uh, and we know that, we've known that for a long time. We find that the system is dominated by individualist approaches, public understanding, uh, healthcare and public health discourses and messaging, and even government policy, right? When health is promoted, it's promoted from an individualist perspective. Why is this case? And we, we, we should really think about that. So Travers in 1996 argues that individualism assumes that the current social system provides sufficient and equal opportunity. I think this is the key phrase that I want you to always think about. 
So the assumption is made that everyone is you know, has sufficient and equal opportunity for individuals to move within the social system according to their abilities. Now this is this if you have studied any sociology, you can recognize that this is inherently false, right? But that's the assumption with individualism. So that's that's a problem with individualism. Right. Um, within this ideological construct, poverty results from the individual's failure to seek, seize the opportunity or to work sufficiently hard within the current social structure. It is not a reflection of inadequacies and inequities within that social order. Think about how much our society prizes individualism. Probably a little, um, we're a little better in Canada, uh, but in the US it's, it's, it's very, very strong. Um, and think about uh, the inequity, men versus women, the simplest example. Over a lifespan, women and men with the exact same qualifications, women will, will earn significantly less because of time taken to have children, to care give and several different factors, right? So is there sufficient and equal opportunity for both genders? I don't think you can argue that. And that's that's a very plain, simple example, but this occurs in so many different facets, uh, depending on what the social determinants are for each individual. Anyway, I will stop now because I believe I'm at the 11 minute mark. So I'm going to stop now. Um, but, and that is the end of my presentation. So I will leave it open for questions. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. So the demo presentation is done. Basically, I want to simply end by saying that you can have as many as four or five slides. In my example, I just had three slides because I had a lot more to uh, talk about in my presentation itself. Also keep in mind that there's no harm in having notes. Hang on to a um, copy of notes or whatever. Uh, don't read through it because the audience can tell that you're reading even if they can't see you. Uh, try your best to know your presentation ahead of time. Keep the notes around for reference, no harm in that. Uh, practice your presentation and then go ahead and record in whatever format you see fit. Um, people have different ways of doing it. Students have done it different ways in the past. You can do a voice over a PowerPoint. Uh, you could probably do a screen grab app on your iPad or um, a Mac, Macintosh computer. Uh, so, and I, I believe I've provided a list uh, of different resources that you might be able to use to be able to produce your presentation videos. All right, I hope this is helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me um, an email and we can definitely address any questions or concerns. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead.